Praise the Lord. Welcome again to um, another opportunity for us to get together and study God's word. Um, as we continue our study, um, our Wednesday night Biblical Academy, um, I'm going to thank you all for joining. Um, as I see people starting to come in, pray that um, in the midst of this, depending on what part of the country you are when, or, or what part of the world you are watching this, um, we're praying for those in the Northeast and Southeast of the United States who are experiencing a, a wintry mix. We pray that everyone's safe and warm um, as we um, gather tonight just to see what God has to say out of his scriptures. Um, this is a, a blessed time. So thankful for the opportunity for us to, to come together and um, appreciate your diligence in being a part of this study. Uh, thank you, Deaconess Fran and Deaconess Carol for joining us. Good evening. God bless you all. Um, Sister Henrietta, thank you for joining us. God bless you. Uh, so um, as we, uh, before we get into our lesson, let's go ahead and, and open with a word of prayer so we can set the atmosphere for tonight. Um, let, it, let us pray. Most gracious and eternal Father, Lord, we thank you for yet another opportunity to study your word. We thank you for, um, we thank you for your word. We thank you, for oh God, that you have left us the Holy Scriptures that um, is your mind, um, is your agenda, uh, are your promises concerning us. And so, Lord, we dare not neglect the opportunity to open your word and to study it. And so we thank you for uh, this corporate gathering, even though virtual, where we can open up the word of God and we can uh, find hope, we can find comfort, um, we can find direction and instruction uh, for uh, the life and uh, grace and mercy that you've extended unto us. So Lord, open our understanding tonight, Lord, I pray that I might decrease and you would increase and God, that you would speak through me um, as we study together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> Once again, God bless you all. God bless you, Bishop. Thank you for, for joining us uh, tonight. And so as we, as we get into our study, um, as I said, today's lesson finds us once again um, in our study of Ephesians. And <clears throat> for those who remember, last week um, we looked at, um, once again in Ephesians, but we looked at a um, specific um, topic, um, you are God's masterpiece, that we are God's masterpiece. And um, in that study, we discovered that uh, the recreation, the what we call the regenesis, the new birth, is the masterwork. It's the handiwork of God that develops us into his masterpiece. Um, uh, as, as wonderful as we might think we are, um, th there is no goodness in us um, that is worth celebrating. Uh, the, the, the goodness that's in us that's, that's worth celebrating is the recreation, the, the rebirth um, that God performs in us, uh, performs in um, a life that's yielded unto him. And so we discovered that there were six, six aspects of the masterpiece that we've been created to be in God. The first is that we are a new creation. The, the word of God makes it clear in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we aren't who we used to be. That person no longer exists. Um, the identity that we used to have um, is not uh, um, who we are anymore. We now have our identity in Christ. Um, we are born again. Um, um, we are a new creation in Christ and that we have the nature of God in us. And so we desire the things of God and we desire the presence of God. Secondly, that we've been created to, um, we've been created righteous and holy. Um, the word of God in Ephesians 4, verse 23 says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We were created righteous and holy. We're not becoming righteous and holy. Um, when we were regenerated by the spirit of God, we were made righteous, holy and without blame in Christ. We're not becoming. We just need to be what God has already created us in the spirit man to be. And so we we um, we know that God created us both righteous and holy. Third, we we discovered that um, we have been prepared for heaven. Second <clears throat> Peter's chapter three, 
um, starting in verse 12, says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. In verse 13, it says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. We were created for heaven. We, Although we are in the natural in the earth until God returns um, and or our natural body expires. But our spirit man was created for habitation in the earth and habitation in the earth but for us to live eternally with God. And so we were created or recreated um, to abide with God in heaven. Fourth, um, we've been made to reflect the likeness of Christ. Romans chapter eight, verse 29 says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are a masterpiece because we were created in Christ's image. Um, we look like God's only begotten. We are a masterpiece because our spirit man was created after the model of the master, that being Jesus Christ. And the fifth, and just kind of giving a, a, a recap of, of last week, um, before we jump into this week's lesson, the fifth was um, we are a masterpiece because we have been saved for and not saved by. We've been saved for and not saved by. Um, in Ephesians 2, we, we read, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And we discovered that works play a role in our Christian walk and a life that is redeemed and regenerated and committed to Christ should exhibit good works. But works don't save us. We are created unto good works, not saved by good works. And so um, while our, our life, rightfully so, I mean, if, if you have committed your life to Christ, if you're a disciple of Christ, if you're serving, you've been redeemed, you've been regenerated, your your life will be full of good works. Um, it will be full of um, fruit that comes from that regenerated life. But it is not the works that save us. Um, it, the, the works are a result of uh, the transformation that's already happened in our lives. And lastly, we are a masterpiece Therefore, walk the walk. Galatians 5, verse 24 says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with their affections and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Um, if we are to be God's masterpiece, it requires that we not live according to the old man and the ways of the flesh, but that we live and walk in the spirit and crucify the deeds of the flesh. And so as we looked at um, Ephesians last week, we, we discovered that, that we are a masterpiece, that um, God has created, recreated us for a divine work. And, um, and it is up to us to um, embrace that and to walk in that. And so this week, we continue to dig deeper into Ephesians uh, to, to gain even more and even greater insights into Paul's teaching. Uh, for those who um, have not um, had an opportunity to um, listen to the um, daily inspirations um, that Bishop Johnson has been teaching at one. Um, shame on you. <laughs> no, but um, um, please uh, check out the, you know, the, the rebroadcasting of those. But uh, for those who um, have been able to um, um, catch you know, those uh, daily inspirations, Bishop Johnson has been teaching us that Ephesians is segmented, segmented into two sections. And so the first section um, covers chapters one through three, which we are still in tonight. And so we'll, we'll, we'll be um, still teaching out of chapter three. But the first section, um, chapters one through three, lay out what God has done for us. Chapters one through three lay out what God has done for us, God's investment into and for us. While the second half of the letter dictates what our obligation is to God um, because of what he has done. So the, the first part is God's actions. And the second part is, is our response. Um, first part of the chapters one through three is what, what has God done for us? What are the great things that he has prepared um, and made um, available to us? But then uh, chapters, um, the second half of the letter um, shows us what is the appropriate response from man? How, how should we respond to this divine God who has given us um, these great treasures or made available to him, the, this great inheritance. And so um, as we finish up the last part of um, God's actions, which the third chapter um, gives us some insight into the extent of what God has extended to us. So as we look at this third chapter, um, we're going to look a little bit deeper into what, what exactly has God given us? What has, has he extended 
to us? And what does that look like? And so part of appreciating what someone, or in this case, God has done for us, is understanding how grand and magnanimous, magnanimous um, that offer or action is. You know, how, you know, part of understanding the value of what God um, has done for us is to really, um, or to, part of appreciating the value of what God has done for us is really great, having a greater understanding of what that gift is and, and what that action um, amounts to. And so today we, we look at the architecture of God's love um, in a lesson entitled The Dimensions of God's Love, The Dimensions of God's Love. So um, yeah, just in case you didn't know, God's an architect. Um, and not only did he frame the, the skies and the universe and, the, and what we see in the heavenly realms, and not only did with his hands did he form and craft the earth, um, we, we know that God is a, an interior designer because he designed the, the temple and, and laid out what worship looks like. But he also gave us a blueprint for the dimensions of his love. God um, showed us what, how, what, what his love looks like. And he, he, he's given it dimensions that Paul lays out for us in this third chapter of Ephesians. And so let's go ahead and jump right into um, Ephesians. And I'm, I'm just going to give us a, a, just a few scriptures uh, today um, to kind of just guide our lesson. And so we're going to be um, looking at Ephesians chapter three, but we, we're really going to just look at three verses, verses 17 through 19, Ephesians three, verses 17 through 19, as we as we discuss this topic of the dimensions of God's love and see, and see what Paul um, says about God's architecture. And so uh, Ephesians three, verse 17 reads that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. And we could actually stop there. I might, I, might, I might touch on that a little bit, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passive knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And so here Paul um, starts out um, talking about that, um, that, it should be the desire of every believer that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith, um, that his, ab his abode would be in our heart. And in order for Christ to take residence in, um, in our heart, um, the, the transaction that must happen between the believer and God is one of faith. We um, give God our faith and he gives, him, he gives us his presence. Um, what an awesome transaction. That um, we we that, um, without money, without uh, uh, fame, fortune, you name it, all God requires of a man is that he um, would give God, you know, direct towards God his faith, and God promises his presence and 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 other benefits and favor that come along with it. And so um, Paul challenges that um, that for the believers that Christ may dwell in our hearts, and but he dwells in our hearts through the faith that um, is available to every man, woman, or child. And um, that, that faith, um, as a result, that, it would, um, that faith would be rooted and grounded in love. And, and it's interested, interesting that um, in his um, symbolism, Paul uses... Um, it's almost as if he wants to reinforce the point that he's trying to make. And, and he uses um, not only that it would be rooted, not meaning that um, using a, I guess, an agricultural term, like this is a tree that is firmly planted, like saying that your faith, that our relationship, that our confidence and trust in God needs to be so deeply rooted. It needs to be grounded, that it's unmovable, that it's unchanging, that, um, that there is nothing that could blow um, blow us away or blow us down. Um, we, we are so um, trusting and entrusted into God that we are, that we are rooted. Um, but he also um, says that it has to be grounded. Um, and so he's, he's in his grounding, he's using more of a, of, of an architectural term, almost as, you know, your foundation has to be in this faith and this trust and this confidence. And so um, Paul is, is making it clear that, um, that, the, the dwelling of God in our hearts um, through our faith is one that um, has to be rooted and it has to be grounded. And it can't just be rooted and grounded on a head knowledge. 
It can't be rooted and grounded simply on um, what somebody told you. Um, it, it has to be rooted and grounded in love. Um, it, that, that has to be the basis, <clears throat> excuse me, of this faith um, that, that um, draws the presence of God in our hearts, that it's, it's rooted and it's grounded in love. And, and so Paul goes on to say that um, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is. And so this is a common, this isn't um, something, a, a mystery that is only for select few. Um, when, when God is present in your heart through faith, when, that, when it, it is rooted and grounded in love, um, you're in a position of where um, all believers should be. Um, it, it is an understanding and is a relationship that is available to all saints. Um, that is, and it gets to the, the subject of our lesson where it talks about the breath and the length and depth and height. And there are many scholars that wonder, okay, what, what exactly is Paul talking about when he's talking about this breath and length and depth and height? Some will talk about um, there, there was a, 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 a tremendous structure in, uh, in Ephesus um, that anybody in Ephesian, any anyone in the Ephesian church would have known. Um, it, it would it would have been like um, let, let's say the the um, Empire State Building or um, or the World World Trade Center or you know or the the White House or you know it would be something a building of such um, structure a, a building of such notoriety that when Paul mentions the, the breadth, the length, the depth and height, everyone would understand the, com the comparison to a, a building of, of that type of magnitude. Um, but Paul wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about love. He was talking about um, the level of Christ's love being compared. Almost, um, Paul almost um, uses these terms because um, um, he really didn't have the words to describe the the this limitless love as he saw it, um, that Christ extends, that God extends um, to man, that, it, that, 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 that the breadth, the length, the depth and the height. And so um, for tonight, we're gonna look at these dimensions and what, what is Paul trying to relate to us as he's talking about God's love and what does it mean, um, the breadth, the length, the depth and height of God's love. So the first aspect, let's let's deal with the breadth of God's love um, as the first point. And, and so when we talk about the breadth of God's love, it talks about God's love being expansive. It talks about the width of God's love. And you might say, well, what does that mean? What, what, what do you mean by God's love is wide or God's love is expansive? And so what Paul is relating to us is that because God's love is divine, um, it has the capacity to be universal. Because God's love is divine, it has the capacity to be universal. And by universal, it means it can cover, it covers everyone and everybody. God's love is so, the breadth of God's love is so wide and so expansive that it can cover everyone. Uh, Second Peter uh, chapter three, verses eight through 10, it reads, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's love is so expansive. It's so universal that it covers everyone, that it, it, it is desirous that everyone would come into that into the fold, that everyone would come under um, the love that God has for us. Um, you know, we, we know it. Um, in, in a, a verse of scripture that every child is taught for John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that's the expansiveness of God. Who, God's love, the, the breadth of God's love is the whosoever of God's love that the whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, in John chapter one, um, he also talks again about um, the, the expansiveness of God's love when we see the scenario of John, um, the John the Baptist. And so the Bible in verse 28 says, these things were done in Beth Bethabara beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. And so listen to John's um, response um, as he, um, and even his words describe the expansiveness, the, the breadth, the width of God's love. When he says the next day, John see if Jesus 
coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I whom I said after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. God's love is so expansive um, that it is it has the ability to take away the sins of not just me, not just you, not just the few, not just Baptists or Pentecostals, Catholics, but his love has the ability to take away the sins of the entire world. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the expansiveness of God's love. Um, Psalms 24, verses 1, uh, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. God's love has breath. God's love has width. God's love is, um, is, has the ability to cover um, because it, um, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But when we think about the human heart, the human heart does not have the ability to love with the breath that God, and not breath as in the, that that comes out of our mouth, but breath as in the width. The human um, heart doesn't have the capacity to love with that expanse that God that, that God does. The intensity and liberality of our love, if we would be honest, it ebbs and flows depending on when or to whom when it is to whom it's directed. Um, while God's love doesn't have those limitations, His love isn't governed like our love is governed. Um, our love um, ha can can be either intense or it can be weak, depending upon um, who that love is directed towards. But God's love doesn't flow that way. Um, in addition. When we talk about the breadth of God's love, when we talk about the width of God's love, um, in addition, there is capacity limitations to man's love. Um, we don't physically or emotionally have the ability to love everyone with the same fervor. While the love of God is limitless, um, it's boundless, it has no borders. Um, God has the ability to love um, as many people as possible, whereas man's love is, is extremely limited. Um, and while God's love um, has the um, capacity to include all at the same time, um, it is individual enough to make room for just me. Um, it is amazing that God's love can be so wide that it can cover everyone, but be so specific that um, it cares about me. Um, when I think about God's love, um, God's love is like the ocean. Um, if you ever get, you ever get to, down to the beach and um, the, 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 the water says no more room, no, nah, that just doesn't happen. Um, no matter how many people are in that water at the beach, um, if you jump in, the ocean's gonna make room for you. And God's love is is that kind of scenario that um, it can it it can um, allow for everyone to jump in. But if there's if there's one more person that needs to get in His love, um, it just makes space for for him or for her or whoever that person is. Um, and so no matter how many people jump in God's love, he's always got room for one more. Um, and he will, his, his love will make room, um, make provisions for that one more. Um, one commentator um, described God's love, love in the context of, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. In Matthew 14, verse 20, um, the Bible says, and they did all eat and were filled. God's love isn't complete. It's not satisfied until everybody's everybody is full until everybody is satisfied until um everybody has experienced that love um god's love doesn't run out until everybody um has been um every need has been met and and not only um does it make um uh, provisions that everybody be full um that same verse in matthew says and they took up of the fragments that remain 12 baskets full so not only does god love have the capacity to reach every heart and make certain that every heart feels and is full with the love of God, um, that his love is so wide, it has so much breath that um, even after he has touched every single heart, there's still more left. Um, God's love is limitless, it's borderless, it's boundless. God's love has breath. Um, the second aspect that Paul lays out for us, so he gives us the breath of God, um, which is the width. But he also gives us that God's love has length. And when he's talking about God's love and the length of God's love, um, he's saying that God's love has time 
and it has duration. God's love has time, but it also has duration. And so first Peter uh, chapter one, verses 19 through 20. Um, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Um, Revelations verse 13, chapter 13, verse eight, um, with the same thought, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus didn't just start loving us. Um, he loved us from the foundation of the world. Um, he loved us from the very beginning and will continue to love us to the very end. It, it would have been um, a corrupt or inadequate love if God's love was only restricted to a certain time frame, um, a certain age, a certain generation. Um, if his love was only available to those who saw Jesus in the flesh, who walked with him, um, but no, God's love goes from creation all the way to eternity. Um, his love um, endures down through the ages. Um, um, his, his love um, is on a continuum, continuum of time that um, it covers us no matter what's, no, no matter where we've come in into um, this, this timeline of humankind. It, it, it covers us. It, God's love has length, meaning it has... It, its time frame covers all that were born into this earth. Um, and so Psalms 136 uh, verses one through three, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endure forever. And it must've felt good to whoever the psalmist was. And, and maybe this was David in Psalm 136, because in verse two, he says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, unto the God of gods for his mercy endure forever. And as if that wasn't good enough, he um, puts down on it again in verse three and says, oh, give thanks to the Lord of Lords for his mercy endure forever. God's love has length um, because it endures forever. It, it is from foundation until um, eternity. Um, it covers us um, throughout that. And um, Psalm 100 verse uh, five um, reiterates the, almost a similar concept where it says, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. The love of God, um, as Paul describes it, has length, which means that it has time and it is everlasting and it extends to all generations. Um, you, you are not born too late for God's love and, and neither are you born too early. Um, his love is from creation all the way until um, we go to spend eternity with him in heaven. And so not only does um, God's love have um, time, meaning that it comes down through the ages, as I said, from creation to eternity. Um, but God's love in its length also has duration. And so what, what do we mean by duration? Duration, um, first, um, first Corinthians chapter 13, a very familiar passage of scripture talks about love, um, the, the love chapter. Um, this, this is the an example of the duration of God's love, um, where it says charity or love suffereth long and is kind. Um, love envieth not, love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, if doth, if doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Um, love beareth all things, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things, it endureth all things. Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. There, there will be a lot of things um, that will fail. There will be a lot of things that come to an end, um, whether that be prophecies, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Knowledge, it shall vanish away. But the one thing about the love of God, it endures forever. It is everlasting. Um, while there will be things that will fade away, will vanish, will fail, um, the love of God is not one of those. Um, it is eternal. Um, matter of fact, it outmeasures um, all of our human sin. How do I know? Let's look at what, what the word of God says. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, um, when we talk about the length of, of God's love, we talked about time, but when we talk about that duration of God's love, this, this is what the duration of God's love looks like. In Matthew 18, verses 20 through 25, it says, for where two or three 
I guess I'm kind of where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. And so verse 21 says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And so I could just say, um, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how long does the love of God last for? And, um, and Peter asked, well, till seven times. And so now nah, Jesus says, no, nah, my, my love lasts a lot longer than seven times. My, my love is enduring. It's everlasting. It doesn't fade. It doesn't fail after the seventh time. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And so God's love, um, no matter the depravity of, of, of the human existence, no matter the, the sin um, that we may um, commit, um, God's love has the ability to endure and outmeasure um, the man's sins and man's actions. Um, his love endures forever. Um, his mercy endures forever. And so in Paul, not only does he describe for us the breadth or the width of God's love that is inclusive for everyone, but he describes a, a length of God's love that, um, that lasts um, um, throughout the ages and throughout the generations, but even on a personal level, um, when I fall, when I fail, God's love um, doesn't fall and fail with me. Um, it picks me up. It helps me and it helps. It, it endures even beyond my sin, even beyond my transgressions. And so um, God's love is not only um, not only does it have time, but it has duration. For a second, I lost my notes for a second. I forgot I, I, I wrote some other things down. And I think I think it's incredible also that when we talk about um, God's love and had an example here. So the first part, um, first part, Paul talks to us in the sense that God's love has um, it has a it has a length and it also has a width. And so um, the, the, there, there is a dimension or there's an aspect of God's love. But but God's love is is even more than that, because if 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 this was the extent to what God's love is, then um, I could I could take his love. And it would be good because it could cover me, it could wrap around me. His God, God's love could cover me. But, but see, God's love has more than just length and width. God's love has dimensions. God's love has space. So not, not, only, not only does God's love have length and it has width, God's love has space. God's, God's love has depth, it has height. And so there are times when just being covered, just being wrapped in God's love is not enough. Sometimes I gotta be immersed in God's love. And so God's love is so deep because it has height and it has depth that for those who choose by faith, and that's what Paul is talking about, whether faith, that if I choose by faith to put my complete trust and confidence that I can literally get immersed inside God's love, I can disappear inside God's love where it covers me from all sides. It protects me. There's nothing exposed um, that can get me outside of God's love. And so Paul talks to us even further as we get into the study, how God's love has this depth to it. It has, um, it has a height to it. And, and what's amazing when Paul talks about depth and height, that, and uh, I guess this would be for, um, I guess for the engineers out there, um, depth and, and, well, no, I probably shouldn't have called out the engineers because I'm probably going to be wrong in this with some aspect. But, but the reality is that depth and height are the same thing. The only thing that's different is the perspective. Depth and height really, um, in some regards, can be the same measurement. It just depends on where you are. Because if, when you talk about God, there is nothing higher than God. So from his perspective, everything is looking down into the depth and how 
he looks down and how he comes down. But from a man's perspective, our, our perspective has to be in height because we always should be in a position of looking up to God. And so Paul gives us um, another aspect of the, the, um, the dimensions of God's love that it just doesn't have length. It just doesn't have width. But God's love has space. It, it can occupy. It, it has it has um, dimensions that I can get into, and those become the 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 depth of God's love, and it becomes the height of God's love. And so, when we talk about um, the the depth of God's love, um, we're talking about that um, God's love um, is so deep that um, no matter where I find myself, um, I can't hide. Um, I can't be far. Um, I, there is no place where I can go that would place me out of God's love. It, it, there is no place on this earth where I can find myself, um, where I can take myself that would be outside of um, his reach. Um, the, the psalmist even declares, if, if I was to, uh, if I was to uh, create my bed in hell, um, that there is something about the aspects of God's love that can just could reach me even there. Um, I can't find a place in this earth. I can't find a place in this universe um, that would put me um, so far away. And so when we talk about the depths of God's love, it, it speaks to the fact that God's love is so great. Um, and, and the depth of it, it comes from the throne room where God sits all the way down to where I am on the earth. And what's amazing is when we when we talk about the depths of God's love, it's, it's as if uh, Paul is saying that the, the depths of God's love go from the throne room where Christ is seated um, on, um, at the right hand of the Father and goes right down to the cross at Calvary, um, where every sin, every transgression um, was crucified right there on the cross. So every everything that I would face, um, every trial that I would face, um, that there is um, God's love is so deep that it can rescue me from anything that I might experience and anything that I may face. And so not only does God's love have um, this length um, because it, I mean, sorry, not only does God's love have this width because it includes everyone, um, it covers everyone. And not only does it have this length because it has um, time to it, it covers down through the ages, um, it has duration, it doesn't, it doesn't wear out. It doesn't run thin. It doesn't um, give up on me. It doesn't fail. Um, but it also is deep. Um, it is it is so deep um, that it descends from the throne room where God is right down to the depths of where I am. Um, no matter where um, I may find myself, um, no matter what sin I may have been, um, I've committed, no matter what transgressions, um, and that's the hope of the believer. And it really um, empowers us, even for those who have experienced that level of God's love, to be his witnesses, to be his evangelists, to be his voice in the earth. Um, because there is no one that we will encounter um, that um, is in a place that um, would deprive themselves um, of God's love. And so we have ministry for everyone. It doesn't matter where you are in life. It doesn't matter um, what you have done. It doesn't matter um, what you what you just rose up from yesterday? God's love can cover all of that. God's love extends and reach down, reaches down even into that depth. And so, not only does God's love has depth, it also has height. And so, um, as I said, we we talk about this perspective of God. Not only um, the depth, which is God's perspective of looking down from His throne into the condition of man. Um, the, the height of God's love means that he and the, 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 it, it would be it would be one thing if God's love would look down upon us and then even um, descend um, with grace and mercy to where we are. But the, the, the love of God doesn't just want to leave us in the condition that we are, um, even if it is in a better condition. God's love desires to elevate us to a height that we could not achieve um, in our flesh. Now, um, when we talk about um, uh, this perspective of the height, there, there are times when 
um, your elevation or your, your station in life can be changed um, uh, through, through m m a man's efforts. Um, maybe you can get more money or you can be more popular or you can get more resources. You can accumulate more things. But when we're talking about the sp in the spirit realm, there is only one way to elevate. And that's through the presence of the Lord. That's only um, from a God who sits high but looks low. And through his spirit is able to elevate man from a car from carnality, from the earth to a heavenly places. That's why we can be seated with Christ in heavenly places, because the love of God reaches down to our depths. But it has a desire to elevate us up to higher places. Um, the Bible um, talks about that um, when we think about this. Um, God's love and the height of God's love, um, it is difficult um, and nearly impossible for man to even imagine uh, the height um, that is a part of God's ar architecture and the dimensions of his love, because his thoughts aren't our thoughts and his ways are beyond our understanding. And so um, in, in man's concept, you know, how can this God of this universe um, have so much love for me that he would come down, that he would send his love down, um, but with the desire to elevate me to heavenly places? Um, that's the kind of love that God has for us, that not only that he's desires to um, come to us, but he also desires that we would come to him. And so God's love has breath, meaning that it has width. God's love has length, uh, meaning that it has time and duration. Um, God's love has um, depth, um, meaning that it, it, um, it is deep and it can reach me. Um, wherever I may be, but it also has height because it desires to elevate me from our, the earthly realm um, that I might be seated in heavenly places. And so um, as we come um, towards the end of this lesson, I, I, I want to uh, leave these last thoughts with you um, as it relates to the architecture of God's love, the dimensions of God's love. Um, and, and it's... Um, Amazing how Paul um, captures not just here in Ephesians, but um, in other um, letters that he um, wrote to um, various churches um, in the Mediterranean um, about this, um, the dimensions of God's love. And I, and I want to read um, and, and, and I would imagine all of you have read this, these verses and know these scriptures. But um, for me, it kind of encapsulates. Um, the lesson tonight and, and what are the dimensions of God's love when we look at Romans chapter eight. And I'm going to read um, these eight verses. Um, I'm sorry, nine verses, um, verses 31 through 39. And think about these verses. Um, um, think about these verses in this concept that God's love um, has length. It has width. It has depth. It has height. But and this is so this is what God's love looks like in, out of Romans eight. And it says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, if God's love is for us, who can be against us? Um, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And here we go. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And so let's, let's get into this architecture of God's love. We, we already said, we already described it one way as length and width and or breadth and, and length and, and depth and height. But, but, but here, here it is again. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, all those things which are the depth, all those things that um, seek to, uh, are a part of the, 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 the curse of the earth, that are part of the sinful nature of man, those, those trials and tribulations that we may experience. No, they, they can't separate us from the love of God. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, through the love of Christ, um, we are more than conquerors. That is, the, that is how great his love is towards us. For I'm persuaded that neither death 
nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. And here we are in verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Christ's love, God's love, um, as we said, Paul um, lays out for us in these first three chapters in Ephesians. Um, he uh, lays out for us so eloquently uh, the, the favor, um, the gifting, the inheritance, uh, the things that God has um, done, the, God, the things that God will do, uh, the things that God has in store for us. Um, and part of that is the love um, that he's extended so freely to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And that if we would, through faith, um, put our trust, confidence, that we would accept uh, the provisions that he has already made for us, um, that don't come by works, that don't come um, by any goodness in us, unless we would take credit for us, um, but only come um, by his grace, um, by his mercy, by his um, eternal love. And the love he has for us, it is limitless. It is boundless. Um, there are no borders to his love. Uh, there really aren't any words that really um, can describe um, the, the love of God. Um, it is uh, so awesome that um, it has no width. Um, there, is, there, is no, there is no one who um, is not covered by God's love. It, it has no length. Um, if God's love was uh, a, a rope, it would extend around the entire globe. Um, um, it covers um, everyone who was ever born. It, you, there is no sin um, that outmeasures the love of God. It has uh, depth to it. Um, it covers us no matter where we may find ourselves, no matter the sin, no matter the transgression, no matter how hopeless we may feel, no matter how alone or forsaken um, the enemy may try to deceive us. Um, God's love covers and, and keeps us even through that. It reaches down from his throne room to that. And God's love has height. It desires, just like, um, um, like Jesus being Emmanuel, God with us, wrapped himself in flesh, came, lived, and dwelt amongst us, um, gave um, his life um, for our lives. Um, but not that we would just remain here, but it was a desire for us to, for him to open a gateway so that we might um, be with him in heavenly places. And God's love does that same thing. It wraps itself and comes down to the deepest place where we find ourselves and uh, doesn't desire to abide with us there but wants to um, raise us up, to elevate us up to where um, his love abides and where it lives. And so God, we thank you for your limitless. We thank you for your boundless. Um, we thank you for your love that has no borders um, and that is available for all who would believe. Lord, we thank you tonight for uh, your word. We thank you for uh, this letter to the church of, of Ephesus which really um, could be the letter to the church at New Harvest. Um, God, where you make it clear what you have given, the actions that you've taken on behalf of us. And God, we thank you that in that is an inheritance, God. And thank you that there is favor. Thank you that there is grace and mercy. But God, we thank you that in what you have done for us is that you have um, created um, uh, this structure of love, God, where um, you've you've engineered it, engineered it so that it has width and so that it has length. But not only does it cover us, not only does it have the ability to wrap around us, oh God, but your love has space. It has capacity um, for us to abide in it. And so, God, we take full advantage of your love today, God, knowing that um, it will not run out. And while other things may pass away and vanish, your love never fails. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Um, I pray that uh, this lesson has been a blessing to you. I pray that God has blessed you through um, his rich word. Um, pray that even uh, during uh, this weather that everybody's staying safe and warm. I, I encourage you that on uh, um, every day, Monday through Saturday at 1 p.m., that you would 
on the same YouTube channel. Join us for um, our daily inspirations that are being led by um, Bishop Johnson. What an incredible time of study and, and the word of God. Pray that um, you will be able to join us. For those members of New Harvest, um, for the women, Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m., um, what an incredible time of prayer um, on our Zoom um, format. And then for the men on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m., um, a time of word and fellow, I mean, time of prayer and fellowship. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, hope to see you on uh, Sunday morning for our virtual worship experience at 11 o'clock right here on this same YouTube channel. Thank you all for, uh, for joining in. Um, God bless you all. Um, keep chatting. I, I, I see the chats going on. Um, yes, God's love is such an awesome gift. Um, it is such an awesome blessing. Um, but um, like some gifts are given for us just to consume and use only for ourselves, God's gift is best received when it's given. God's gift of love is best received when it's given to someone else. So especially even during this time, during this season, during uh, this trauma that our nation and world are going through health wise, economically, uh, um, socially. Um, what a great gift um, the body of Christ can give the world um, by displaying and sharing God's love, which has no, no breath, no length, no depth, and no height. God bless you all.